Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the consumer debate Sailing into the Wind, the EU role in improving patent, uh, patient access to medicines. My name is Agustin Reina. I am the Director General of TEUC, and I will be facilitating this session where we are very pleased to have as speakers representatives of our Belgian member organization, Testasha, the European Commission, the Spanish Ministry of Health, Medicine from Europe, and the non-profit organization, GARDP. I would like to thank them and all of you in advance for joining us today on a very critical topic, health and medicines. As we all know, the last years have been particularly difficult. The COVID-19 pandemic has had far-reaching public health impacts, medicine shortages have made headlines across countries, and the health system faced growing financial pressure. It is good to see the EU reacting to these challenges, creating new structures to better prevent and respond to health crises, and by adopting a pharmaceutical strategy that lists many relevant and extremely important initiatives. For example, the revision of the pharmaceutical legislation. However, as the title of this uh, event and conversation indicates, the EU is still sailing and has a way to go to improve equitable access to medicines for everyone in Europe. I look very much forward for um, the contribution of the many speakers, but as well as the interaction with uh, all of you that are joining us today. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Julie Frère, uh, who is the Head of Communication and Public Affairs at Testasha, and who will put us into context by developing further challenges that consumers face concerning medicines. So Julie, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Agustin, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about this very important issue for consumers uh, across Europe. So just maybe a, a few words about uh, Euro Consumers and Testesha. So, so Testesha, we are a Belgian consumer organization uh, established in, uh, in 1957, and we count more than 300,000 members. And uh, we are a member of Euro Consumers with the Altro Consumoni in Italy, OCU in Spain, and Deco Proteste in Portugal. And um, of course, we are a member of uh, Book uh, as well from the, the very uh, beginning. So um, beginning 2024, um, we ran a survey to know what the expectations of the EU citizens were uh, with regard to the upcoming EU elections. And we saw that consumers have one very clear uh, request for the incoming MEPs and the new European Commission. It is give us access to affordable medicines. So you will see uh, on the slide that this ranked first of the consumers' priorities polled in uh, the survey that I just mentioned. You can see it here on the slide, 83% uh, of uh, the respondents um, chose this option. And for a good reason, we think, because consumers face several problems when accessing uh, medicines. So here are a few situations and reasons uh, why consumers cannot always access the medicines they need. Um, and I will talk about three topics mainly. The first one is that the medicines are not always available because there is a shortage of medicine. The second one is that they're not accessible because they're not affordable. And the third point is that medicines are not being developed because pharmaceutical companies don't expect high profit margin on these medicines. So let's dive into these, these, these three points that I've just uh, mentioned. Again, with uh, Euro consumers, we, we ran a, a survey uh, to measure drug shortage prevalence in Belgium, Italy, uh, Portugal, and Spain, and the experiences of the uh, respondents who have been faced with the shortage. So which drug was not available? How much time did they have to wait? What were the reasons they were giving for not having the drug available? Uh, to what extent did it have an impact on their health? Um, did they have to experience extra cost, etc.? So it was conducted in those four countries in February and, and April 2024. And uh, it was from a, an online self-administered questionnaire. Um, and we collected around a thousand valid answers 
um, of a population age 25 to 74. So really data representative regarding gender, age, educational level and, and region of each of the, the national populations. And what did we see? You can see it uh, on the slide here. Well, our survey found that almost 40%, you can go back on the, on the previous slide, please, that 40% of households have experienced a drug shortage between January 2023 and January 2024. So in one year, this is quite an important uh, number, of course. Um, on the next slide, you will see the impact of this shortage on consumer. The first impact is the impact on their health. So seven, uh, sorry, 53% of respondents experienced symptoms or problems as a result of the drug shortage. You can see in detail, so among those 53%, you see that 50 expressed worries or anxiety for not being able to access their medicines, 40% reported worsening of uh, symptoms, 13% needed to take temporary sick leave, and 12% had side effects of the new uh, medication or substitute medication they, they were taking. So very concrete impact and effects on consumers' health. The second effect that I would like to show to you today is the cost for the consumers. And you can see on the next slide that 27 27% of those surveyed experience additional costs because of the supply issue. So either drug related costs, so you can see it's 13% or transportation costs if they had to import the medicine from abroad, for example, medical consultant costs, uh, 3%, and even loss of professional revenue for 2% of the respondents. So again, a very concrete impact on a consumer. So that was the first point I wanted to address with you, the real and concrete impact on drug shortages on consumers' health and consumers' um, money. The second point I would like to address is the affordability of medicines. So we can see uh, on the next slides that expenditures on medicines are increasing steadily due to the skyrocketing prices for some classes of, of medicine. So you can see here on the left-hand side figure, between 2014 and 2022, so over eight years, the government's budget to reimburse medicines increased by more than 30%. And on the right-hand side figure, it is equally worrying. It's the large and increasing share of the medicine's budget where the reimbursement is negotiated between pharma companies and the government behind closed doors. So as you might all know, pharma companies agree to give these price discounts to individual member states in exchange of absolute secrecy on the real price paid by the public sector. For us, this is a short-sighted self-interest strategy that maintains the issue of exorbitant medicine prices and goes again the, the principle of public accountability. Though, of course, increasing medicine prices result sometimes in high uh, cost for, for patients, uh, the impact is mainly indirect as social security systems are reimbursing most medicines. So it's not directly fed by the consumers in their pocket. But it doesn't mean there is no impact. We think at the contrary that the impact is, is huge. We can spend one euro only once, of course. So money we spend for medicines, we cannot spend for other public health needs, psychological care or dental care, for example, which are coming today with a very high out-of-pocket cost for consumers. And the future doesn't look optimistic because we don't know how long we will be able to keep this system based on solidarity, which is needed to give access to care to everybody who needs it, he needs it today. So I just wanted to show you on the next slide a few of the actions that our organization, Tessasha, has undertaken in, 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 the few, uh, in a few years. So you see that we filed five complaints um, against pharma companies before the Belgian Competition Authority. Uh, against um, so pharma companies which were uh, asking for exorbitant prices for their medicines. Sometimes we had positive results, like 
for example, in the case Roche Novartis uh, for Avastin Lucentis, that got fined in Belgium, even though the fine was not huge, but still it is, was a symbolic victory for us. Uh, the Aspen case that was investigated by the, the EU Commission is also a positive result, but sometimes we just do not have any uh, results at all. For example, Spin Raza from Biogen or Zolgen Sma from Novartis, we, who really ask crazy prices for these new uh, medicines. So in conclusion, what we see is that there is a concentration of development of medicines for diseases for which companies can charge unjustified high prices. And we can see that prices of hundreds of thousands of euros, for example, in cancer or rare diseases are not an exception anymore, unfortunately. And at the same time, what we see is that no new medicines are developed for diseases that companies consider are less profitable. And the blatant example of this is of course antibiotics and it, and it brings me to my, my third point. So what we see today is a market failure. If pharma companies are reluctant to invest in research to develop antibiotics, it is because of the low profit potential as compared to the other medicines we just uh, re reported, uh, we just uh, mentioned and, and which report them billions. Um, <clears throat> however, there is a high need today for new antibiotics. If you look at the, at the numbers, uh, in the EU economic area, we have each year 35,000 people who die from infections with bacteria that are resistant to antimicrobials. So this, numbers, this number is a number that has increased in recent years. And globally, the situation is, uh, is not better. We have uh, at least 1 million deaths each year since uh, the 90s. And uh, the, the forecast uh, is, uh, is uh, rising and up to 2 million in 2050. And without further policy interventions, global deaths which re would reach almost 40 million between 2025 and 2050. And that means the equivalent or of three deaths per minute. In contrast, what we see is currently in the pipeline, in 2023, those are the numbers for 2023, 97 antibiotics in the clinical pipeline, 32 of them, so a third of them, address bacterial infections on the WHO bacterial priority pathogens list, and 12 of them, so a third again, can be considered as innovative. Only four of these 12 are active against at least one WHO critical pathogen, so the top uh, risk category. So what can we do um, and what do organizations like your consumer and Tasesha uh, put forward as, as a measure that could be undertaken uh, at the EU level? Of course, it sh those measures should be taken at EU level because the problem of access to medicines is multifactorial and member states alone cannot fix it. So the EU has a real important role here to take measures. These are, these are one of the measures that we think the European Commission should contribute to. With regard to shortages, we think that prevention plans should be set up. So to really strengthen supply chains, the pharma companies should develop shortage prevention plans for old medicines and not only for critical medicines. With regard to safety stocks, to mitigate the impact on consumers of any supply disruption, we think companies should keep a minimum of two months safety stock for critical medicines, and it should be harmonized across all EU countries, not like we see today where certain countries ask for six months, other for two, so harmonized across the whole EU. And we also ask for dissuasive penalties. So the companies that do not meet their supply related obligations should face penalties that are really dissuasive and harmonized across countries again. With regard to the prices, we think the EU should really facilitate that member states join forces to negotiate prices together with pharmaceutical companies. And there are some experiences that we can build on, like partnerships between countries as Benelux I today, or the joint procurement of COVID-19 vaccines by the Commission. So, 
we really think that by way of joint procurement of medicines, the societal interests have more weight in the discussions. And for this reason, the EU should not only be used in the context of cross-border health threats, but also for other medicines, like, for example, expensive new therapies, therapies for cancer or rare diseases, for example. And finally, uh, we think that new model of drug development should be put on the tracks. And this should really ensure that medicines reach the market at affordable prices and that drug development focus on the greatest medical needs. So, for example, putting more uh, public uh, condition attached to, to public funding, more support to nonprofits, uh, etc. Thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, that was extremely interesting to hear the yeah, experience from the ground directly. So thank you so, uh, so much. Uh, we have some time for questions. If um, someone in the audience would like to ask something to Julie, um, now, is, now is the moment, um, which uh, doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you very much, Julie, for your contribution. And now the idea is to move uh, into a policy discussion. Um, and I would like to welcome to the stage or to the screen um, Liana uh, Petrosova, Regulatory Policy Manager at and Medicine for Europe, Cesar Hernandez Garcia, Director General of um, Common Portfolio of the NHS and Pharmacy at the Spanish Ministry of Health, Rohit Malpani, Senior Advisor at the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, and Chava Gali, Deputy Head of Unit for Medical Countermeasures at the Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, HERA, from the uh, European Commission. Thank you very much to all of you for uh, joining. And after hearing um, Julie's presentation, I propose to start the debate with the subject of antimicrobial resistance, a growing public health problem, as it was flagged earlier, and a key challenge that we face uh, in relation to the lack of sufficient efforts and commercial interest on the other side in the development of antibiotics that target resistant pathogens. And I would like to start with a kickoff question with uh, you, Chava, uh, in relation of uh, how is HERA supporting the development of uh, priority antibiotics? Thank you very much, Augustin, and uh, thank you very much for inviting us uh, to this meeting, which is a uh, Looking forward to this very interesting event. Uh, of course, this is a very good timing uh, with the new commission just being set up. Uh, Hera is very interested to get all input for or inputs, and it's always useful to hear what you think about what Hera is doing and what Hera should be doing. Uh, well, we all know that pharmaceutical legislation is mainly in Santa competence, uh, but Hera does a lot to address all the aspects that raised uh, in uh, Julie's presentation before. Uh, in fact, access access to medicine have always been a core business to Hera since the since the the it's it's pouring out of the pandemic in the wake of the pandemic, and ensuring uh, uh, vaccines and and uh, treatments for for COVID was was is, is formative uh, uh, event for for the existence of Hera. So I think Hera will be able to to address or try to address all the issues that she mentioned development stage shortages, access. Um, but okay, let's start with uh, what we are doing with AMR and uh, how is HERA uh, trying to, to help. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, this is an aspect where we are focusing on, on research and development. HERA has access to the EU for Health uh, financial program, which was created uh, uh, only in this mandate. And uh, we're trying to, to fund activities, development activities of companies which are responding to the priority threats. And one of the priority threats is, is AMR. So for HERA, this is this is clearly in one of the one of the focus issues where we would like to allocate funding for, for R and D. So new antibiotics, particularly those that are targeting multi-drug resistant uh, infections and priority pathogens are, are in our focus. I can give you a number of examples what HERA has been already doing. Uh, for example, we mobilized uh, 20 million euros to support uh, GARDP and uh, WHO for clinical trials in three areas, children antibiotics, 
gonorrhea and antibiotics against serious sepsis. Uh, to give an even more concrete example, we, we I think at the end of 23, we successfully completed the clinical trials phase three for uh, a new antibiotic uh, to, to treat gonorrhea. But maybe Rohit will speak more about this, so I wouldn't like to uh, uh, take all the all the all these points. Uh, we're also funding the WHO to update their priori the, the bacterial priority pathogen list and its implementation, as well as the WHO review of the antibacterial agents in the clinical and preclinical uh, development. But uh, we also recently provided funding to the development of pediatric formulations for anti-TB medicines, which are not available in the EU for the moment. So I, I'm sharing uh, uh, the assessment of Julie when she said that there are some market failures for R&D. And indeed, for antibiotic development, there is an economic challenge of low profitability and limited incentives for pharmaceutical companies. And we're trying to put all the financial incentives, but uh, uh, of course, limited by, by our budget. Uh, and we, we create new pool incentives as well. Uh, and as a result uh, of this effort, we are designing with the member states together a multi-country revenue guarantee pilot project, which would improve access to innovative antimicrobials. Uh, this should be a pilot for the beginning, but it should be able to, to scale it up to innovation size if it is, uh, it is delivering positive results. We are now only in the preparatory phase, but we are consulting with the member states to understand the needs very well. In addition, moving a little bit away from, from uh, funding concrete R&Bs, we're also supporting innovative companies who are uh, coming up with new solutions for, for our priority uh, threats. As I said, AMR is one of them. Uh, Hera Invest is a, is a, is a venture that uh, solution which we, we developed together with EIB and we allocated 100 million euros to, to fund innovative SMEs who are in the, in the development phase and looking and, and have a financial gap to, to finish the, uh, the funding of their clinical trials. And, and we, we have very high hopes that we will be able to fund uh, European companies in the, in the short term that uh, we're able to, to address uh, issues like, like AMR. And of course, in the future, our plan is to continue our, uh, using our funding instruments to support the development of priority antibiotics as well as ensure it's that we have access and availability once we reach market level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Ava, for, for sharing this insight with us. Um, indeed, HERA plays an extremely important role, and we believe that will play in the future even an even bigger uh, role. So we are we're very glad that, that you can be part of this, this conversation with, uh, with us. You mentioned GARDP, so I would like to bring uh, Rohit into the, the conversation. Um, so you can share with us, first of all, why it's important that HERA supports nonprofit organizations like yours, but also what else can be can be done at, at HERA level to support uh, drug development from, from your perspective. Great, and uh, thank you very much for inviting us. Just um, a quick word about GARDP, which is a not-for-profit partnership. Uh, we, we work in all stages of the drug development cycle. Uh, some of the work is in early stage development and uh, clinical and pharmaceutical development, uh, and then trying to strengthen access both to the antibiotics that we are developing or are licensing in, or sort of trying to build a better ecosystem. And uh, you know, we try to focus on the needs that are defined by the World Health Organization, um, which in many ways then also guides what a lot of countries try to focus on. Um, just one word, you know, I, I think it is right to call AMR uh, a market failure, but it is also very much a public health failure. And, and that's important because if, if we only see it as a market failure, you know, the, the tendency then will to only focus on the things that actually provide the greatest commercial return. And so some of the areas in which GARP is invested in and, and Harris invested um, on behalf of GARP, for example, for neonatal sepsis, there will never be a market for that, but it is a serious public health problem. You know, one out of every five deaths are, occur in children. And so it, it's having this broader remit of both thinking as a market and public health failure. Um, so GARDP has sort of three components to its model. You know, I think as the uh, opening remarks made the point, the, uh, the importance of access. So what we try to do is to integrate concerns around access as much as possible into how we do our research and development, whether trying to drive down the cost of the end product, 
or trying to generate evidence globally so that you know when the new antibiotic is approved, it can be used um, where it is required and doesn't require additional uh, operational trials. And and that is you know for example zolafladesin, it wasn't just tested in high income countries but also high burden populations, for example in South Africa and Thailand. And that ensures that when if the drug is approved, it it can be used in those populations at that time. The second part of our model is the importance of partnership with companies, and that we try to operationalize that through licensing and collaboration agreements that both give us the freedom to operate and sort of really clearly define what the roles and responsibilities are of Guard P, of other third parties, and of the companies we work with. And I think that gives everyone clarity as to ultimately how a drug goes to the pipeline and then comes onto the market. And then thirdly, it's really important for us to think about equal partnerships. So not only in terms of the companies we work with and with research entities, but especially with governments and, and you know, countries and operational sites around the world so that we can ensure that we're doing things equitably. And I just wanna emphasize you know, everything that has been said about HERA, it's really played a critical role in supporting GARDP over the last few years and you know, looking forward and um, funding our priority research programs, including our work on gonorrhea and for zolofladesin. And you know, we continue to hope to be able to strengthen that relationship and also including how we roll out zolofladesin globally, including in the European Union. Um, and just in terms of you know where we would like to see Hera uh, focus on the future, we think there is obviously continued support for the work on push funding, um, not only for GARDP, but also for other entities um, throughout the drug development cycle, including early stage development. Uh, we also think Hera can play a really important role in trying to strengthen you know, targeted pull incentives that um, can therefore provide supports to the companies we work with. And we think especially, you know, for example, a procurement mechanism that um, uses a revenue guarantee could be one way forward for, for Hera. And as a last thought, it, it is really important that Hera, uh, and I think to their credit, they've done this, including supporting some of the work for Guard on Access, thinks not only in terms of European priorities, but global health priorities, um, because ultimately the concerns that exist elsewhere around the world are ultimately going to be concerns also for Europeans. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rohit. We're getting some interesting questions, but before going um, to the questions in the chat, uh, I would like to bring um, you, Cesar, <laughs> because it was put a lot of emphasis on ensuring uh, access. So what do you think uh, about the idea to promote antibiotic development through a system that combines EU joint procurement and a revenue guarantee that ensures return on investment uh, at the end of the day, like, for example, the UK is doing? How, how do you see that development from a, from a member state perspective? Well, uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the the invitation. <clears throat> I think that we need to, to separate what, what is the issue with the new antibiotics, in which we may find this subscription model very appropriate, and, and we are going to participate with, the, with HERA, which is Spain, in this uh, pilot. And, and, and we think that is the best way to explore these new antibiotics that we uh, really don't want to be used on a, on a general basis. But in restricted uh, uh, situations and under the control of the hospitals and so on. But um, but the, I think that this is very different from the situation of the old antibiotics. And and we also need to to, to address this this point because um, you know this is part of the uh, of a pharmaceutical sector that is really very unbalanced and that combines the as, as Julie has mentioned. The issue of the uh, you know problems to access new medicines, but also problems problems to access old medicines. You know, uh, fifteen years ago, twenty years ago, all uh, new medicines were in the hands of the same companies, and and probably they can offer uh, you know deals that involve uh, both parts. Now it's completely different for, for many people. All medicines have uh, you know lost part of the of the. Um, you know, interest to be a market, and 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 we need to do something to to do that. And and the only way to do the, to do this is to yeah to work on the on pricing policies or to work on procurement policies, which in the end is not the same, but that can result in the in the in the same. I mean, the problem it has been also mentioned by Julie. The problem with with um, with um, uh, public procurement is that if uh, you do not involve Everyone in that, in the end, you are generating different markets from different with different sizes, and you know difficult to manage. So, uh, and, and it's a tricky situation because I mean, with the 
with the new antibiotics, we can, you know, handle this. I, I wouldn't say exactly as we manage the COVID situation, but but on a little bit non-regular uh, manner. But if we are talking about how we uh, procure uh, collectively amoxicillin, for example, we we don't want to have complex system for distribution. We we want that the patients and consumer access the the medicines in the in the in the well just as they get access to to other medicines or in the in the pharmacy or or whatever. But so it is a little bit more complex to 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 work with the old antibiotics. In that sense, as a member state, I would prefer. I mean, probably it's a no, one by by one. Uh, um, case basis, but uh, I would rather prefer more effort from the member states to really uh, have a coordination or agreement in a level of pricing to manage all antibiotics and then distribute and get access in the same way we have that favoring, uh, you know, big joint procurements. I would say another thing, and I stop. It is difficult joint procurement and joint negotiation. I, I was part of the of the of the you know European procurement of of, of vaccines during COVID. I participated in the no in the joint negotiation team, and what we did in that occasion was a kind of joint negotiation with the companies. So uh, we have a group of equals with the same objective, with the same level, pretty much of responsibility. Uh, and this is different than just, okay, an open procurement uh, that voluntarily anyone can uh, can apply or not. And and we much favor this uh, for the future, uh, joint negotiation as a, as a whole, uh, increasing the, you know, yeah, the co-responsibility of member states for sure with HERA and the, and the European Commission. But in that part of procurement and access where the main Involvement is in the in the member states. We think that we need to to increase our cooperation and our um, you know uh, have a single voice to 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 speak with other actors. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Cesar. Fully fully agree. I think we can do much more uh, together. And I would like to pick up on, on joint procurement um, later as well. Before uh, moving to Liana and another very important uh, topic that we have, I would like to ask a, a question to you, Chava, that was raised in the um, in the chat. If you want to say anything about when they join the, um, the pilot project on guaranteed revenue, uh, we'll start. If there is something you can say on that, we can- Yes, thank you very much. Uh, before that, I would like to subscribe to what the colleague said, that this is a complex issue. It cannot be reduced to simple market failure, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, thank you very much for the questions on the pilot project. Uh, we are in the middle of developing it. So member states have expressed interest to participate, 21 of them, which I think is a, is a very good number. But I, because they have not yet committed, I wouldn't share uh, uh, particular member states is participating or not. Uh, timing is, of course, also depending on the, on the member states' uh, uh, participation. We aim to conclude by the beginning of next year. So this is not a, not a long-term project, but something that we are immediately working on. Super, thank you. Thank you, Shara, for that, that clarification. Um, I would like to move now briefly uh, to another topic that is extremely important in the current, in the current reform. And I would like to start with, uh, with Juliana on this. Uh, and I would like to ask about the commission's proposal to introduce in the EU pharma legislation transferable exclusivity vouchers to promote antibiotic uh, development. Just for the audience, as a, as a way of uh, background, background information, and the way these vouchers would work is that uh, in exchange for of developing a priority antimicrobial, the pharmaceutical company will get a voucher that allows it to expand the monopoly of a more lucrative medicine of its own, or to sell it uh, to another company uh, to, be able to, do the, uh, to be able to do the same. So then my, my question uh, is, are transferable vouchers uh, a good tool to promote the development of uh, anti antibiotics? And particularly to you, Liana, uh, what will be the impact of these vouchers to generic and biosimilar competition? Thank you, Agustin. Um, and thank you so much for inviting us to join this discussion. Um, so as, 
as you just said, you know, uh, medicines for Europe we represent generic by similar and value added medicines. Um, so as a disclaimer, you know, our companies are not in the market of uh, developing new um, antibiotics as such. Um, so obviously I will be looking at it from the perspective of uh, market entry for um, generic and bisimilar product, um, where obviously we see a number of issues with uh, having a voucher uh, or having a voucher system. Uh, and first of all, I, I'd like to go back to the point that Julie mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that you can really only spend one euro once. Um, and I think this will be a big uh, problem in case of the transferable vouchers, because, of course, it will essentially delay uh, market entry for generics for probably a number of blockbuster um, products, um, and it would have a huge impact on um, the healthcare budgets. And um, as we, we mentioned before that, um, I don't know to what extent this is an impact that healthcare budgets can really handle. Um, so that's why we as Medicines for Europe advocate, you know, for different ways of uh, incentivizing um, development of uh, antibiotics. But at the same time, um, we also have to recognize that IMR um, as a problem, it's uh, very multifaceted. And one of the big um, issues with it is that access to existing antibiotics is just as important as access to new antibiotics. Um, so having right antibiotics on the right time with the right patient um, is uh, absolutely critical. Um, and I would say that we can't be looking at it only from the perspective of developing this new product. We have to think of how we can preserve access to the ones we have um, and how we can really make sure that uh, we have sustainable access to the antibiotics that have been in use for a long time and are still effective. And how can we make sure that there is no overuse um, and that um, there's, you know, um, reasonable approach to um, to keeping this existing antibiotics on the market. Um, and another point that I wanted to actually bring up to Jaba is um, we're very happy to hear that um, that DG Hera is supporting development of new products, uh, particularly you know with the initiatives like Guard P. Um, I think one area where we would like to also see more support is in um, kind of supporting adaptive innovation or repurposing what we call it, um, and really trying to look into the existing antibiotics and how we can make them better, uh, or how can we create new formulations um, that will add value for certain you know, um, population groups, uh, for example, pediatrics. Um, we know that you had this grants for um, development of new formulations. Um, I think one area where we would like to see DG Hera uh, act is um, really trying to update the existing marketing authorizations that we have um, and creating uh, new formulations for pediatrics for existing products. Um, so yeah, this would be my my call. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. You mentioned the impact for public health budgets. So Cesar, I need to bring you into this conversation. Is there anything you know that you would like to share on the on the implications of uh, of transferable exclusivity vouchers on uh, health budgets? Well, first of all, we need to acknowledge that we need to do something to solve this situation, and and so I think that what is not uh, you know a, a solution is not to do anything. So we need to explore, maybe we are wrong and we need to, but we need to explore how to, uh, to, to, to bring to the market, or bring to the hospitals or bring to the patients uh, new antibiotics because we really need it. What is our position about butchers? I, I mean, if I have to say, I mean, I wouldn't like to have, you know, a product without any, uh, ending period of uh, protection. So I, I, I would rather prefer to have alternatives. Having said this, to explore in a control way, uh, a butcher just once for one product to see what may happen for us would be a kind of, uh, you know, uh, yeah, by the trying to do something in a problem where, again, I think it's worse not to do anything that 
uh, be run and uh, and under a controlled situation have a failure on, on how we do it. Uh, we need to uh, fine tuning how we can do the, do this. And again, if we do another things uh, through the procurement via through pricing, uh, through public private collaboration, through I mean that would be nice, and we can uh, you know then avoid a system that may be very complex to to, to build and, and very complex to apply. But again, if the voucher is the only alternative uh, on the table, we would prefer to to have this experience before saying no. Thank you, Cesar. Very, very good point. Um, I would like, I know, uh, Shaba, that you know, this is not your, your, your direct competence, so I'm not going to ask you what you think about the vouchers. But there is one point that, um, uh, that it was mentioned by, by Liana uh, about the idea of repurposing. Uh, is there something that you can, you can tell us about you know, whether this could be a, a feasible alternative? Uh, well, yes, on the vouchers, yes, this is there is ongoing leg uh, legislative discussion in the, in the parliament and in the council. Regardless of if I'm sitting in Santa or, or Hera, this is not something that I can comment. But of course, I'm I'm I'm, I'm following gladly this discussion and, and with great interest. Of course, I will uh, report back to our colleagues who who are responsible for the for the farmer legislation, uh, the the adaptation and uh, supporting adaptive innovation. Of course, this is this is something that is is, is of great interest to Hera, and we already looked into into TB medicines and repurposing them or or broadening their scope to to pediatric formulation. Uh, we we are very happy to 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 hear more about this and more suggestions. But this is certainly something that is uh, that is interesting for for Hera's activities. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Shala. Rohit, I was uh, ready to come back to you exactly on this. Uh, um, yeah, well, so first, just around the, some of the work Hera has done. So, for example, in supporting Gartree's work on neonatal sepsis, um, that's actually taking existing, actually generic medicines um, and testing them in new combinations to, to determine, you know, which ones could be more effective. So we fully agree with that. And, and you know, one of the things I did mention in terms of the Whistler stuff is, of course, developing pediatric versions or generating evidence to, to use in children and babies. Um, you know, I think the way that we're trying to come at the, uh, the TEV or the transferable exclusivity voucher is really trying to think about it pragmatically as somebody doing product development. And, and I think the way that, you know, our research and development teams try to think about this is, you know, we want to see incentives that are as direct as possible. So one of the challenges potentially with the TEV is that because it's sort of an indirect incentive, you know, I think the concern is it doesn't really get to, you know, supporting those that are actually engaged in research and development and providing the funding for, you know, where the bottlenecks are. Um, and that is one of the benefits that Harris had is really actually being able to assess in the pipeline where I can put its investments and ensure that therefore it's tailored to sort of bringing a product to, to where it needs to get to where sort of where the deficiencies are. Um, I, I think the, the other challenge that, you know, perhaps emerges with the TV compared to some of the other options is that uh, one of the things that we're also very focused on is ensuring sustainable access. And one of the benefits, for example, of um, some of the other proposals, for example, like revenue guarantee, is that it creates a contractual relationship essentially between a member state and a supplier, and it ensures that you have sort of a, a stickiness so that, um, you know, there are obligations both on the government to be able to pay rightfully for the research and development, and then also for the supplier to ensure that it's meeting certain requirements in terms of registration and pricing and supply. And so, you know, but uh, I think I would agree that we, we do need to see something emerge, but I think we really have to make sure we get this right because um, we, we recognize that there's a real need and, and that there are different options that are out there that, you know, should be tested and ultimately should be brought forth. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rohit. I would like now to go back uh, to the question of procurement and safety, safety stocks. And, I think it's really important we touch base on equitable access to medicine beyond cross-border health uh, threats. And as Julie uh, mentioned, the prices of new treatments are really high. That's a reality we have to face, especially in some therapeutic therapeutic areas. And as a result, uh, you know, the public uh, payers have to make difficult choices about which medicines are going to be uh, reimbursed and patients, especially in a smaller member states, face greater you know, challenges uh, because pharma companies are not always interested in launching their products uh, there. 
And most recently, for those that have read it, the Draghi report calls for assessing the prospect of expanding the scope of EU joint procurement to encompass treatments beyond those in response to cross-border uh, health threats. And I would like uh, to bring you, Shava, again uh, on this. And do you think this will be a useful tool to help to improve equitable access to medicines in the EU? And if so, you know, for which type of products this can be, this can be a helpful uh, instrument? Thank you. Uh, let me go back a little bit, because you said that we should go look beyond uh, cross-border health threats. But I think we also need to look at cross-border health threats. Because that that is that is what is giving us basis to see what can we do beyond and what is the experience. And I think I, it is worth recalling this experience. So access is is uh, is as I said, uh, access to medicine is a key key priority for Hera to ensure pandemic preparedness, to to make uh, MCMs available, medical countermeasures available and accessible. And this comes from COVID. But it's not limited to COVID and it's not limited to crisis. We have used this extensively in crisis. We also use it extensively to prepare for new crises. We have contracts to, to prepare for pandemic influenza. We have contracts to, to avoid pandemic, pandemic influenza with the contracting pre-pandemic uh, zoonotic uh, influenza vaccines. But we have also uh, uh, have used the joint procurement tool to improve availability of not crisis related, but still uh, cross-border health uh, threat related uh, uh, medicines. And I would like to give you the example of a diphtheria antitoxin. And I think that would be a bit uh, showing what are the, the, the possibilities of using joint procurement uh, beyond the crisis situation. Uh, in, 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 I think in August, we signed HERA and eight participating countries a contract for diphtheria antitoxin. Our call was opened uh, after member states notified that they have no access to this product. The only EU producer, which is a Bulgarian company, had no capacity to deliver to several EU member states. And we, thanks to the JP, we aggregated the demand from these eight participating countries. And this aggregate demand was interesting enough for a Scandinavian company to accept it and to import the product and to cover the needs of the EU. So I think J JP or joint procurement uh, is, is an important tool because it is capable to aggregate demand and increase the negotiating power. And uh, it is really, really important also to add that joint procurement main goal is not to decrease the price. We always rely on the, the most uh, economically uh, beneficial tender is the, the meet criteria. We, we would like to ensure security of supply. And that's, that's I think, is, is a key to access and availability. Because if there is no access and availability, it doesn't matter how much money it costs. So you, you mentioned the Draghi report, uh, which recognized the benefits of joint procurement for what we already use it and suggest that we, we expand the scope. I would like to also mention the letter report which is also uh, an important report looking at, at uh, on the Commission's initiative. And it, it echoes the same thing uh, uh, what the Draghi reported a couple of months earlier and calls for expanding the scope of, of JP. Of course, HERA's mandate currently is uh, medical countermeasures against serious cross-border health threats. But we're trying to see uh, if there is a possibility to expand this scope. For example, we are currently looking at uh, and you, you know very well, uh, trying to address the shortages of critical medicines. We're trying to see if uh, joint procurement could be used to somehow aggregate demand, signal the industry that there is a high demand for certain uh, critical medicines, and they could then improve their production uh, capacity, especially through long-term contracts with a phased-in approach where, member, where, where industry would have time to ramp up production to satisfy the needs of, uh, of uh, such a contract for, for joint procurement. So we try to see even for, because some of the medicines are, are medical countermeasures, while at the same time they are also uh, medis critical medicines that are under the risk of shortages. So 
We try to see if within our mandate, is there a little bit of role to, to look beyond uh, uh, crisis preparedness? And, uh, and uh, well, if and how this could be further extended following the, the, the latter report and the, the Draghi report, this is something that we are currently looking at. Uh, but since this is this is the beginning of the co college mandate, uh, and there is no uh, political discussion having started yet, we are in the really the preparatory phase, looking at the conditions to do that, the benefits, the advantages, and the disadvantages. So in, I'm I'm really looking forward to what the participants participants in the panel have have to say about this, because of course this will be important lessons for us. Indeed, thank you, thank you very much, and and, and of course uh, we need to learn from the past. And obviously, you no know, cross-border issues. You know, looking from a single market perspective, have taught us a lot about uh, joint uh, joint joint procurement. And like you say, um, you know, affordability and accessibility are the two sides of the same coin. At the end of the day, we need to ensure that those medicines reach you know, the hospitals, reach the consumers, and the and the patients. Um, on public procurement, I would really like to hear from um, uh, from you, Cesar. Now, you mentioned already this as a as a tool. Um, for which type of products, you no, know, we could uh, implement it, or would it be more interesting for a country, or a, if I can say a big country like Spain, are we taking talking, for example, of medicine for rare diseases? So, where do you see uh, opportunities um, in in your case from for Spain in in joint procurements? I think this is a good question. Um, well, for, first of all. Um, I think that we need to use any tool and probably in different situations, different tools can be uh, of, of value. So, so we cannot dismiss any of the, of the tools that we have uh, on board. Second, uh, from my position right now, I think that we need to build a group of member states with the same responsibility on price and reimbursement to really take steps forward to, um, you know, to be able to negotiate uh, for different medicines, not only for cross border threatened, uh, but but also for ultra rare diseases, probably, or some, uh, you know, medicines with a high impact where to really take the value of uh, um, 450 uh, million people uh, in Europe, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a must for, for, for us, it's the, it's the same. I have to say that uh, for me, it was very encouraging to see in the case of vaccines, where how we were given as member state and for sure under the, the, the you know, the, the, the background and, and the umbrella of the commission to start the vaccination in the COVID at the same time in our countries. I think that it would be very difficult to explain that different countries uh, gave access to their citizens uh, to the vaccines in a different time. So, I mean, taking into account that we have different markets, different sizes, different countries, different practices, I think that we need to 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 reach an agreement on how to move forward with these problematic products, products where the, the, the issue of having access in one country and not in another is really difficult to explain to the citizens that belong to a club of 27 uh, member states. So uh, we need to, to, and we have next week um, a meeting of the so-called national competent, competent authorities on price and, reimburs uh, and reimbursement to take steps forward in how to organize ourselves to really work in that, in that way, how to, to, yeah, even in the, you know, in the, in the future, uh, have the possibility to start a negotiation uh, on behalf of the 27 member states. And I think it's quite important. And again, in that situation is not a joint procurement that is just, uh, what, it's not just, I mean, to say just is not because it's, it's a low value, but it's only the, the aggregate demand of, of, of different countries. And we need to change a little bit. The, the, I mean, if we, Give the power of uh, more than that, 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 uh, uh, 450 million people. If we want to take the, really the value of this big market, we need to send to the to the sector signals to in which direction we want uh, we we would like to move. 
So it's how to be prepared to, to change this system that is mainly uh, based on the uh, capacity of the companies to offer a product to this new situation where 450 million people sense what do we need to really fulfill our needs? Or what do we need to really fulfill that situation in which we need some kind of uh, you know, new treatment or something like that. So, and this is can only be done if we take steps to 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 work together and really, you know, find a way at least in the beginning for some specific products. Uh, ultra rare disease, I think, is Absolutely. maybe in the future. I mean, uh, products for dementia or for products for uh, you know that may have a really big impact in in all the countries as the COVID had. Um, yeah, to 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 use this. Um, common to join forces in this common negotiation. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cesar, for this reflection. And I think that's a good bridge um, basically to discuss the interface between procurement and medicine shortages. And there was a, a study of the European Commission of 2021 uh, where it shows that uh, medicine shortages often involve older, of patent and generic products. So the question is, can public procurement practices help enhance uh, medicine supply security? And if so, how? And I would like to go uh, to you, Liana, on, uh, on this, specifically with a question that concerns the public buyers, like hospitals. If they procure medicines from very few companies, could that impact then the level of players that stay in the market? And if so, how this can affect competition also um, among um, genericals? Thank you, Augustine. So I think it we are jumping here from the joint procurement into national procurement as a as a concept, um, which I think is very important because they um, they are a little bit different in my opinion. Um, I think one hundred percent for sure, uh, procurement and pricing reform will be the solution to uh, medicine shortages that we see today, and I think it's the only real sustainable solution to. Uh, bringing critical medicines to patients uh, in Europe. Um, I think what we see, unfortunately, now is that many countries are still using uh, kind of pricing and procurement strategies that um, were designed 20 years ago or 30 years ago, perhaps, um, which don't really take into account all the realities of the market. And what um, happens is that when... Um, those procurement practices are coupled with constant price pressure and constant inflation um, in terms of the cost of operating um, for uh, or keeping those particular medicines on the market. Um, we end up in a situation where companies choose to not have certain products um, and we end up with high concentrations of what you talked about when instead of, let's say, having a healthy market where you would have uh, six or seven um, marketing authorization holders, so manufacturers of medicines per product, you end up in a situation where perhaps there's only two or three. And if one of them goes in shortage, then everything else kind of crumbles. Um, so um, what um, we see is that um, we need to really overhaul the way we uh, look at uh, pricing and tendering of uh, medicinal products in Europe. Um, and as an association, we at Medicines for Europe call for inclusion of um, meet criteria, so most economically advantageous tender criteria, which focus on um, getting um, uh, not only Getting, getting the regulators to focus not only on the price, but also on other important criteria, such as security of supply, environment, and others. Um, but then on top of that, it's also not only about the criteria that you use in your tenders, but it's also about how you design the tender itself. Um, is your tender um, intended in a way that it will have multiple winners, uh, or are you relying on only one or two? Um, do you account for um, sufficient lead times, so the times that it takes for, for manufacturers from manufacturing to bringing product to the patient. Um, there's a lot of uh, different uh, specifics that need to be considered when we're designing tenders. Uh, but I think also separately, um, the, the, the question is, can we also refine the system of pricing and how we price generic medicines? 
um, because, um, as I said, there is inflation um, that has been really, I mean, we've all felt it in other areas of life, uh, but it also has been real in the pharmaceutical sector, in the generic sector, for medicines that are already very affordable. Um, the costs are just rising all the time. Um, and there are new drivers for cost that maybe we will talk about later when we talk about, uh, you know, stockpiling or shortage prevention plans and other things. Um, but yes, we need to recognize that the costs are really going up. And if we want to um, still ensure sustainable market, we need to completely revamp this system. Thank yeah. you. And um, sorry, Cesar, I need to ask you <laughs> as a follow-up question on that. How do we strike that balance? between you know availability affordability in in procurement you know ensuring that um also the public health uh, budgets are are manageable well uh, first i think that we need to maintain competition uh, i mean the, the best way to 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 ensure that you may have availability is to have different producers that may compete in the market and we need to ensure that this competition it's really healthy to say so. I mean that that is based on 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 issues that are really worthwhile, because sometimes this competition is based on you know tricky issues like uh, how to en entry into the market or something like that, and in the end it's, it's very difficult to put it together. Second, I think is I mean if we, then we need to maintain competition in those medicines that they still have this competition. And we need to ensure that we are not going to lose that competition. And then we need to recover those products that lose that competition some time ago to see whether we can, again, stimulate some competition and maybe increase pricing in the beginning. It's like a, you know, a failure of the, of the system, but maybe it's the first step to really have competition and then down-regulate again the prices without a key intervention, and then we have public procurement. I mean, public procurement is uh, definitely a tool, and probably it's a tool that is uh, worthwhile to use in in some situations. But again, if the public procurement is just giving the the full market to a to a single player, I mean, we are losing competition, and we are, you know, we are, um, yeah, we are, we are being in the in the hands of a single uh, actor, and and this is not what what we want to 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 do. So we need we need smart uh, public procurement in order to yeah promote competition, have enough access. I mean, have one winning that is probably uh, you know making the effort to to serve the uh, a big part of the market, but without um, you know um, having other players out of the market because otherwise we are going to to be in the same situation that we are now with very old products where only one player. Have the possibility to 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 supply the market. We need a smart pro competition public procurement. <laughs> that should be the headline. Um, Rohit, <laughs> sorry, Cesar, you want to say something on this? No, probably not this. But uh, <laughs> I mean, but but it is important that we have these key ideas in the in the mind because yeah. otherwise, I mean, to, to be honest, let me say so. I mean, one of the problems that we have with public procurement are when I mean, when you try to 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 have these smart processes. In the end, there is one auditor or someone that, following the the public procurement laws, say, "Okay, you have to rely only on price and avoid any other uh, consideration." And this is not fair. And this is not fair. And this is what uh, probably has, uh, you know. Uh, provoke in the end the situation in, in where we are. Thank you, Cesar. Very quickly, I want to go uh, to you, Rohit, because uh, GARDP has its own procurement policy. And uh, so is there something very brief that you can tell us about you know, how you learn, what you can bring us from that experience, and what criteria do you consider when, when choosing a, a supplier? Very, very briefly, um, before we move on. Yeah, very quickly, I'd actually turn it around. So we, we do have a procurement policy, but it, it's actually more that we have to think as a developer what we need to do to provide um, drugs to procurers. And we also are working with governments to develop pool procurement systems. So a few things to think about. So fully agree on, on the importance of affordability, but also in terms of 
maintaining certain prices. Some of the generics manufacturers that we're working with are, you know, they're willing to take the risks to enter into some of these um, product categories, but want to ensure that there is, you know, at least um, some level of return that they can receive. So that that is important. I think though there's a, a corresponding um, part of transparency there. I think um, secondly, we, we do think security of supply is important. So certainly in terms of multiple suppliers to be able to ensure that when one is unable to supply that others can step in. And then really importantly for us in the antibiotic space is the environmental consideration. So we do require our sub licensees to meet certain standards set both by the AMR Industry Alliance and the World Health Organization. And we're even trying to go beyond those. In terms of pooled procurement systems, uh, it, it really is just important that uh, again, countries do, we, we are trying to work with countries to develop sort of joint collaboration mechanisms so that they can provide a clear signal to manufacturers as to what their demand is. And, and that it is something that we think is not only going to be beneficial in low middle income countries, but for the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. Always really interesting to hear your, your experience. Um, I'm following on the topic of um, medicine shortages. Now, we know that some member states have introduced um, obligations of pharmaceutical companies to maintain certain levels of uh, safety stocks for critical medicines and to mitigate the impacts of any disruptions in the, in the supply chain. Uh, France was one of those, uh, those countries that introduced, and we see other countries also moving towards that, that direction. And of course, this diverge in approaches creates some tension, so can create some tension among more member states uh, and could have also an impact uh, on the availability of medicines in their, in their countries. Um, so I would like to, to hear um, your opinion about the safety stock obligations and perhaps starting with you, uh, Liana, um, in relation for which type of, of products do you think uh, this, could be, this could be important to justify? Um, thank you for this question. Um, I think we've seen indeed that more and more countries are now introducing the stockpiling criteria. Um, I think one of the important things that we need to consider here is that um, we as an industry usually see that shortages are not pan-European. Um, most of the shortages are concentrated in, let's say, two or three countries. And usually the best way that we can solve them is by reallocating and moving product from one place to another. Now, in case when there are national stockpiles, uh, this essentially means that it's not so easy for us to reallocate product and that, in fact, a um, certain amount of product just has to sit somewhere in a country without us being able to use it for any other purpose. Um, it's, you can imagine the, the industry, the, the pharmaceutical industry doesn't uh, like this kind of approach to, to stock keeping because A, it is expensive. In, in most cases, uh, it is the manufacturer that has to pay for the upkeep and the costs of those products. B, it is wasteful, um, obviously, because once if there, there is uh, risks of products expiring and then there's high risk of write-offs. And then lastly, um, this really is a hurdle to flexibility and solidarity in bringing products between different countries. Um, so I think um, I would say that perhaps there are areas where you could consider stockpiling, uh, but right now we see it more of as a hurdle uh, into solving shortages rather than um, a solution. Um, and um, we also obviously see that uh, it creates a discrepancy between the countries and a preferential almost treatment of certain countries you know, that have stockpile obligations. Um, and you also need to keep in mind the fact that, as I said, it is increasing the costs of keeping a product on the market, right? The stockpile. Uh, which further <laughs> exacerbates the issues that we talked about before um, on regarding to competition, you know, when it becomes too difficult to, um, to pay for an upkeep of certain product, there is more likeliness that companies will um, choose not to. And that's why we also need to be very careful because if you are going to introduce, let's say, stockpiling for certain older products that are already at risk of shortages and that are already um, maybe have rather vulnerable supply chains, um, in terms of the amount of, you know, um, actors on, on the market, then you may actually uh, inadvertently uh, exacerbate the problem and actually make it more difficult uh, uh, for companies to, to keep these products in their portfolio. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Cesar. 
How do we deal with this? <laughs> do we I need to I, I was next. <laughs> Spanish obligation? Yeah. Is that the solution? No, I mean, first, I think that uh, I can understand why some member states have forced these uh, stockpiling policies, because I have to say that the way some companies have behaved uh, with these shortages, have been very have put the the, the the agencies and the and the governments in in, in difficulties. So first, we need a yeah, we, we need a to understand each other in how this process of shortages and uh, uh, you know uh, works in order to find the best solution. So having said this, I think that the stockpiling is more uh, defensive uh, um, um, action than a proactive uh, solution of the of the problem and it may introduce you know uh, differences in the market so it may privilege those with uh, with the obligation for stockpiling maybe create the incentives for the second or next to double the stockpiling of the product and then the third and you know and this is not going to 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 be a solution second i regret to say that for me it's very difficult to understand how the companies are going to deal with this stockpiling obligation without increasing the price or trying to you know recover the cost of the stockpiling so in the end is is uh, uh, in our shoulders to to have the the solution. So if we, uh, I mean, I, I I come to to the beginning of my intervention. I understand why in some uh, uh, um, situations we need to guarantee that we have a stockpiling of the product because we cannot uh, live without uh, any product. But to have stockpiling as the solution of the shortages, I think that is very wrong idea. That we need to work in other uh, direction, trying to identify how to, you know, uh, have uh, shortages out of the agenda and uh, without a, a stockpiling. I think that part of the problem, uh, sorry if I come back to the same, is that, uh, you know, the, the, the regulatory framework in Europe is, is only Sorry, the, the 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 pharma package in Europe is mainly regulatory and has not competences on price and reimbursement. And we need to pull together in the same line, because otherwise the solutions are only partial solutions and not uh, solutions that can uh, uh, you know take the the problem as a whole uh, or um, look at different uh, solutions in different parts of the of the problem. But then. Um... One can look, of course, at the cost of stockpiling, but also the cost of shortages, <laughs> because at the end of the day, because, it, will, it will cost you more in treatments. The cost of shortages is enormous. I, I can enormous. I can tell you, we we did a, a study twelve years ago. I mean, this this is a problem that has been under the level of detection of the radar for many many years, but it's it's a problem that has been there for for a long long time. It entry into the political agenda maybe five, six years ago, but it's long-standing uh, problem that we have all around the world. I mean, it's not in, only in Europe, also in the US, also in other countries. It's a complex problem and we need to try to identify what are the main problems for the, for the, and try to, to, to put the solution. I agree with you, the cost of shortages is enormous. Direct cost, indirect cost, um, you know, time for professionals, time for patients, for, for, for patients, and and and. But again, there may be, without uh, saying that uh, stockpiling may be part of the solution, in some circumstances, but there may be other solutions to address this this problem. But that, that that are not just you have to increase your 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 level of uh, stock. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, Rohit or Liana, you want to come come on this? Rohit, maybe from your side. Yeah, I, I mean, just quickly, you know, we, we are, work through a program called Secure with a lot of low and middle income country governments to basically think about how to have a good package of policy solutions for 
equitable access to antibiotics. It's something that Hera has helped to support actually during its uh, last funding cycle. Uh, and stockpiling is important for these countries also, but you know, so there is a need to think about um, the global coordination we're also going to have. Uh, you know, we talk about shortages in the European Union. There's also shortages, of course, in other countries. And there, as it relates to antibiotics, this has really serious downstream effects. It forces providers either not to treat an infection or to use a, you know, an antibiotic that isn't appropriate, uh, essentially to treat an infection that then can help to drive resistance. So, um, yeah, so I think just the, the thing to say is that this is something that requires, I think, better coordination, not only within the European Union, but also globally. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Liana, do you want to come on? Yeah, on maybe just, just quickly, I want to add, because um, there was a comment also in the chat that indeed it's a good practice of companies to keep stocks. And I want to say that companies do keep an inventory um, of their own um, bulk or finished products internally already. So in fact, every company has safety stocks. Um, those safety stocks are kept within company and they are used on a rotating basis in the most efficient way. Uh, and those safety stocks are the most precious because um, they can be kept uh, on the, let's say, pan-EU level and the company decides how they're going to allocate it to different markets. Um, and I think we really need to keep that in mind when we are creating additional stockpiling requirements that it all comes on top of already exist existing um, systems of shortage prevention that includes inventory and safety stocks. Thank you. Cesar, I see you. Yeah, may I something? I was not talking about the stockpiling that the companies may have to guarantee that they are going to serve the market. This is an obligation that should have the companies and there may be penalties uh, that really, uh, you know, uh, are used when a company really has a bad behave and 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 do not serve the market. No, I, what I was referring to was additional stockpiling to ensure that a market failure is going to be solved by six months, for example, of product in a in a warehouse. This is what I I, I refer to, and for sure the companies should have that obligation and that may be penalties to, you know, to ensure that, that this is, uh, you know, fulfilled. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, Rohit, you want to come in on this? Yeah, I, I saw Chavo said his hand up. I, I just want to make sure we're, we're not losing sight of how many more companies are closing down their, uh, I'm speaking for antibiotics, their, their manufacturing plants, even in the last year. Um, this is both multinationals and in a few cases generic. So one of the things GARP is really working on is, is trying to find new companies both in Europe and around the world to take an interest in the antibiotic market. So I, I worry we're getting so focused only on the, you know, sort of the demand side that, you know, the, the supply side is an enormous part of this conversation um, and may require much more public investment actually to, to keep some either companies in the market or to develop alternative approaches. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, before uh, we, we start to wrap up, I would like to bring one, one question. Um, that I see here in the in the chat for everyone that would like to to react. This is from uh, PGEU, so the um, the pharmacist association, and they would like to ask um, if uh, you think that regulators should monitor more closely marketing uh, strategies when they are uh, supply tensions. For example, with the recent case on diabetes and weight loss medicines. This is a very pertinent question. So, um, anyone would like to uh, chip in on this one? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, I think that we have uh, in our in the EU legislation this uh, falsified medicines with a, a unique identifier that may allow us to control altogether how is the you know supply to the market and to be sure that you know that the supply is enough to fulfill the needs that that we need that that we have. Um, uh, and I think that it's a powerful tool to monitor that situation. And I think that it's in the interest of uh, of all of the actors in the in the sector to really, uh, you know, um, make possible that uh, although this is not one of the foreseen uh, intentions of the legislation, that once we have the, that opportunity, we we can use it to really, in a very fair way, monitor that the uh, market is supply and an adequate way. 
Yes, I agree. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cesar. And now for the for the closing, I would like to invite you perhaps to share some thought, thoughts or reflections. It can be um, what is your wish list, what would you like to see in the next commission, or just some some thoughts that this discussion has a trigger uh, in you. And I would like to start with you, uh, Shaba, if that's uh, that's okay. Yes, thank you very much. I also wanted to reflect a little bit on the, the previous speaker said. Um, and this will not come new to anybody participating in this event, but of course the Commission has recognized that uh, shortages is a complex issue and simply regulatory aspects would not, not solve it. And, and it's one of HERA's priority now is to address the shortages of critical medicines with, with, in a holistic way uh, and looking at industrial policy actions that go beyond regulatory actions and, and beyond the pharma package. And we, we created the Critical Medicines Alliance in April uh, with the intention to involve all stakeholders in, a, in an engaged discussion uh, where they would help us to identify vulnerabilities of the supply chain, the root causes of shortages, and propose recommendations on how to address them. And uh, of course, this, this is a this is a long process, but we are we are we are very glad that that uh, all stakeholders, including MFE and uh, including the national national. Uh, uh, including the member states are participating very actively, and this is this is very very encouraging to us uh, in light of the of the upcoming mandate. And uh, on the topics that you mentioned, uh, the alliance looks at at all aspects. They look at uh, how procurement uh, and the procurement practices uh, shape the way that shortages occur, and how the procurement practices changes to procurement practices could maybe used to address shortages including the possible extension of joint procurement, including the use of meat criteria, including the, the, the different practices that the national regular, the national uh, uh, procurers could follow. Uh, and, the, and the alliance or the, the member states and the industry participants of the alliance also look at how various levels of and forms of stockpilings uh, can contribute to the security of supply of critical medicines. And I'm not only talking about contingency stocks, I'm talking about shortages or, or stockpiles at EU level, national level, company level, but also stockpiling of medicines, APIs, unfinished products. So we, we are very much uh, uh, optimistic that, that uh, we will have recommendations from the Critical Medicines Alliance uh, by the beginning of next year. And uh, if, if you would like to ask me how, where I would see in the future, uh, well, the, the mission letter and the, and the policy gu guidelines of the new, new, new and old president uh, uh, issued is uh, mandated HERA to propose a, a critical medicines act. So I, I hope that in five years, we will just have the co-legislators adopted the critical medicines act, which will reassure the industrial uh, players and create an a framework for them to, to ensure that uh, we have a strong industry base of the EU on critical medicines or in all medicines uh, in, as, a, as a secondary effect, which will, uh, which will address shortages. And then I hope that uh, the Commission will put forward a robust proposal that will already have the signaling effect that, uh, that Cesar mentioned, and that we will already see the, the first result uh, on, on addressing shortages. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shaba. Hey, Rohit, very briefly, your yes. wish. So uh, just a, probably a bit of a repeat. Um, I think first, uh, obviously looking a bit just from the perspective of GARP, the, the need to make antibiotic resistance, you know, not just something that is sort of one of many priorities, but just simply seen for what it is, which is really a cornerstone, at the need for antibiotics as being a sort of cornerstone of medicine and where, you know, the investments can be made over the long term with the form of certainty and, and really seeing this as, as we think as a form of almost public infrastructure. Um, you know, we think this is what's really positive about HERA is that you sort of have now uh, an entity in place that can, you know, strategically support research and development and access. And, you know, we, we hope that there continues to be the funding and the political support for HERA to continue to make these decisions on behalf of the European Union, and also to think more broadly in terms of global health need, whether it's for push funding, and as we talked about earlier, you know, really targeted pull incentives such as a revenue guarantee model. Um, we want to make sure that we we kind of get away. And I think you're sort of touching on this a bit with the stockpiling, both within Europe, but globally, not to create dichotomies, false economies between needs in different parts of the world or different populations. So we really have to think of research and development and access models that really are trying to focus on global public health needs and the needs of populations that, you know, may not seem urgent at the time in the European Union. 
And then just finally, in terms of access, you know, we, we do agree as in the opening remarks that this is a, you know, continues to be a really serious concern. And, you know, again, we think in the model that we're developing to really try to integrate as much these access considerations up front so that, you know, we can narrow the gap between when you sort of have, have access in countries that have the most resources to those that have the least and the populations that have the least. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. Sesa? Yeah, I appreciate very much all the efforts that uh, we are doing all together to to really find a solution for this, because it's a it's a huge problem. We need to rebalance the system. We started speaking about the yeah difficulties in availability of new expensive products. We end up in the discussion of how to uh, create the incentives to recover all very cheap products that we also need to recover. We also talk about increased competition. Uh, we need, and this is part of, of the of the equation, we need to ensure that we as Europe uh, have the resources and the facilities to produce medicines and not and to decrease, not to avoid uh, globalization, but to decrease the dependence on third countries. We also want to, to be leaders in science and development and public uh, uh, research and and public private collaboration. So this is a very complex system, and we need to to have a to take a look at the system as a whole, without trying to uh, intervene in each and any of the um, parts of the system with partial solution. Because uh, only we consider this as a whole, and we uh, clearly identify what are our uh, mandates and objectives. Uh, we will succeed on that. And to do that, I think that we need to join our forces to, to, to work on that. Taking into account that what we need is a kind of group of equals. So people with the same level of responsibility, the same level of um, yeah, accountability on, on, on in front of, of, of their citizens. That, to be honest, it was what made a success, the, pro the, the, the project of uh, public procurement of vaccines in COVID. So solid direction and the implication of people with the same objectives, the same level of political representativeness, because mm -hmm. it is important that, uh, I mean, we we we, are, we we do not make this, a, a, for sure it's a technical discussion, but in the end there may be, uh, you know, political decisions to uh, to to set up a direction in which we want to move. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cesar. Last but not least, Liana, from your side, very briefly. Thank your... you. I'll be Please. very brief, because um, to be honest, most of it was already uh, um, said by, by the other panelists. Um, I think I would um, echo what uh, Java said at the beginning about the Critical Medicines Act. Um, so in five years' time, I really hope that the act is operational, that we have a very good symbiotic kind of relationship between the industry and European Commission where we're able to really address the problem of shortages from different perspectives, both the manufacturing um, and, you know, investing in manufacturing in Europe, uh, but at the same time addressing those um, kind of high level problems and uh, particularly around pricing and procurement. Um, and I, I really hope that in five years we have way less shortages than we have now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Also to the audience for being um, so active. You no, know, the the chat was uh, on fire. So I think all the the participants and the um, and the speakers will be able uh, to see all the all the reactions. And um, just a very final uh, point from uh, from my side and on behalf also of um, of Beuk, we cannot forget where we are coming from. You know, Ten years ago, this would be unimaginable to start talking about joint procurements. So much has happened since then, and we have been able to build on past experiences. Many of them, they were the result of crisis. You know, I think COVID-19 was a game changer in, in European policies and in, a, in, the health, um, in the health sphere as well. And so I'm, I'm convinced that we can move forward. Uh, there are two points that we will raise that we will need to do more together in order to rebalance uh, the system. And I really hope, like Jana, you say, that in five years' time, when we revisit this discussion, that we do not face 
especially consumers, patients, and, and governments, we are not having the same discussion about the need to tackle uh, shortages. And that is because we have been able to rebalance the system and have a good, um, a good mechanisms or a toolbox uh, in place uh, to ensure availability and affordability of, uh, of medicines. So that's uh, from our side. I would also like to thank um, all the participants, also my colleagues, uh, Ansela, Sandra, and Christina, who were fantastic in putting this uh, event uh, together. And I wish you all an excellent uh, evening. And we will surely continue this discussion in this forum and other places as well. So all the best and thank you so much for, for joining today. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much.